Welcome to this second uh, qualitative methods um, podcast. This one will be about questionnaires and focus groups. And again, similar to the the one on interviews, it will go through some of the pros and cons, some of the reasons why you may or may not use them, and how if you are going to use them, how you might want to think about employing them. So we'll start with with questionnaires. I know a lot of you are thinking about uh, using questionnaires because they, they seem to be quite an easy way to, to generate quite a lot of information. And that is true, but there are um, a lot of subtleties to, to doing them well, so that you end up with a, a questionnaire that is focused, that is appropriate, and that actually gives you the things that you want. So in a bit like with interviews, the preparation and getting the questions to focus and the sampling process right is, is absolutely essential. Because otherwise you end up with a, a set of uh, results which are either a bit partial, a bit skewed, or don't really answer the question that you're trying to do. And there are a number of key questions here that you that you need to think about in terms of the application of this methodology. And the first is the question that, that, that probably most of you will be asking, oh, how many do I need? How many questionnaires do I need to do? And again, the answer is as many as possible. With, with questionnaires, because you're looking for that, that cumulative wealth of data, that, that almost that numbers do matter more than with some of the methodologies. So always the more the, me the better because when you start getting above say 40 or 50 different questionnaires you can start to, to look for trends within the data. If you only have 5 to 10 or 15 it becomes a lot more difficult to try and say the, these are valid or these, are, these are, um, answers are replicable across different areas. So in general the more you can get the better and this is why taking the time to prepare it and think about who you're going to sample and why you're going to sample that population is quite important. The second question is, is, is how, how long should they be and how many questions should they be? And this is quite difficult because um, depending on what the issue is, you might have to have a lot of questions that, that lead up to the, the, the big killer question. But if you have too many questions, people will invariably stop doing them. And this is, I think, one of the reasons why SurveyMonkey might have a 10 question limit on its free software is that you need to try and get to the point and get to the point quickly um, so it's sort of you need you'll need some some leading some contextual questions you'll need then the questions that are about the the heart or the thing um, that you're trying to find out and then maybe some more contextual demographic questions at the end um, if you think about the length of the questionnaire and the time it takes to do it in tandem that will t tend to show you whether or not you, you might have one that's too long because in terms of how long people will take to do a survey I mean you probably all know you probably all done them uh, the quicker the better the less time you have to think about it the less arduous it is to actually do it either by filling it in or doing it online the better it will be but um, a lot of the, the research companies people like Ipsos Mori say that about 12 minutes is the max that people will stop and do something so just think carefully about again how many questions and how long it might take uh, if you're doing it online it might be a bit different because you're you're not necessarily taking time out of your day in the same way you are if you're being stopped in the street um, so just think about if it takes too long will you end up with the sample size that you that you want linked in with this is the type of questions you might want to ask so are they open the questions? Are they closed questions? Are they scalar questions, like Likert scales, or a mixture of all these things? And the the, the table on the on the right there just gives you a, a couple of ideas about what sort of questions you might have. So situational or leading questions, so that leading into the um, the issue rather than leading, as in telling them what the answer is. Um, to, to situate the the information and 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 the, and the project that you're doing. Uh, more focused research question on the core area, additional contextual questions I've just talked about, scaled questions, so on a scale of 1 to 5, how much do you like issue X or product Y, uh, or you might want to do a preference thing, so uh, from disagree strongly to strongly agree on a scale of like 1 to 5, uh, how much do you think the University of Manchester is good at something? Something like that. You might have more open-ended questions, so it'd be a box where people can't be filling their data and to say this is what I think. Uh, and then multiple choice. So you might say, um, in terms of getting to the university, how do you come? Do you come by bicycle? Do you walk? Do you get the bus? Do you get a train? Do you drive in? Other. 
and you might have a box that people can tick a number of different ways. So in terms of um, using all these different types, most good questionnaires, most questionnaires that, that lead the person through to where you want them to be in terms of answering the, those core questions, will use a variety of these different techniques to try and elicit information. Now, taking that a bit further, it, you have to think about how you try and get people to do this. And again, it, it, it can be quite difficult. So are you going to do it outside? Are you going to do it on site? Um, so are you going to spend time there? Um, sort of saying to people, excuse me, would you do a survey? And if so, what do you think the response will be? And how how much or, or how high do you think the response rate will be? Do you think everyone will say, yes, I'd love to do your survey? Or do you think people go, no, I'm too busy, go away? Uh, if you're doing it online, you have to think about how you might target different groups. And if you are targeting them, how do you then ensure that they are who they say they are? So the validity and continuity across the across the piece. Um, so in terms of the sampling and how you go about doing this, the, these are things that you'll have to think carefully about because you'll need to ensure that you're providing yourself with opportunities to get the biggest sample size you need. But that sample also needs to have a, um, a rigor or robustness to it to make sure it is who it says it is. So doing things online can be easier because most people now have access to the internet or their smartphone. But whether or not people are who they say they are is a question that you'll need to think about and, and, and write into your methodology. So that ensuring that there's continuity across the answers and validity in the data can be quite tricky. But depending on where you set this up and... So arguing that people are uh, invariably honest and people aren't going to lie and people aren't going to make data up, then you can you, you can sort of hopefully get some some level of validity across what you're doing. You also need to think about the design and layout. So what does it look like? Is it easy to follow? Is it sequential? Does it go down the page? Does it go across the page? If it's online, is is there a logic to the questions and how they come? If you are using multiple choice questions, is it set out so that people can read the question and read each of the individual things? Can they then actually tick more than one if it's a multiple choice question? And again, if you're doing these things online, SurveyMonkey or, or sort of like, is actually quite helpful for these sort of things. They have their templates. If you're doing it um, to do it um, as a hard copy, so do it face to face, it's probably best if you print them out and, and, and look and maybe ask again ask your friends or your or your classmates just have a look see if it actually works um because if you are doing it face to face are you going to hand it to the person to fill it in are you going to fill it in for them while you're answering the questions so how will you administer the survey and this can be quite tricky because it can take a lot of time you take a lot of effort uh, you might have to stand outside in the cold for quite a long time people might ignore you people might, might, might shout at you um, but invariably it is better if you fill it in for them rather, unless you think that they are cap well, not capable but it, it, that you can read their writing for instance and and so you have to think a little bit about the where's and the how's and the why's you might want to administer this and then finally you need to think about the types of data you might collect so is all the data going to be um, uh, numerical is it going to be contextual uh, what, do you, what do you want and how you analyze it so doing just um, basic statistical analysis isn't necessarily going to get you that far, so you need to think a bit more about that. Um, there are lots of books on questionnaires, so um, if you'd like some, we can give some more. Now we're going to move on to focus groups. And focus groups are a, an odd entity. They are both incredibly helpful and incredibly difficult to do, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so in terms of the, the positives, the pros, they they use when you want to try and create a, a group dynamic and discussion so a bit like when you were presenting to yourselves um in week four about what your ideas were you were you, you were presenting then you were having a discussion it's that group dynamic it's that feeding off each other's ideas to to progress the level of thinking or debate further forward which might not necessarily come with with the interviews and because of that they can provide far more nuance in terms of how people view an issue or a phenomena so actually this gives you people more chance to say oh yes i remember that and then add something to it um and so therefore unlike in interviews where there's a like a, a binary direction in terms of i ask a question you answer it this is oh she said that he said that and we build on that so it, it can be um a lot more interesting in terms of the debates that are had uh, they can also be quicker and cheaper than doing individual interviews because you're getting more people in the room at the same time. So it's a, um, a bringing together of resources to then 
uh, talk to a lot of people in one go, which can be quite good. And when you get that and when they work work well, you, you end up with the conversation moving in directions which you didn't necessarily plan. So you get new avenues of discussion being brought forward because the group understands things differently and because there'll be different power relations in there that you might not have thought out or thought of. And it allows people to, to build on each other's ideas as well. So it's a cross-pollination of ideas that participants will present and then diversify um, what they think even further because the conversation will be more appropriate and contextual to what they know. So in terms of the, the outcomes, it can be a lot more um, nuanced and focused than you might get with a single interview. But there are some quite significant cons to this. So firstly, they can be difficult to facilitate and manage. So you've got to try and get people to to discuss something, but discuss it in a civil manner without somebody taking over. And invariably, in, in many folks to, groups there there's one person who is even more knowledgeable or louder who starts to dominate and you've got to try and moderate that to to ensure that everybody has the opportunity to have a say um, you need to be careful about who you invite so is it just the same old people who always do planning consultations or, or similar things or because you want to try and get a, a good representative uh, sample of the population that you're looking at um, and that can be quite difficult in terms of timings, in terms of some people won't go to meetings before other people are there. So it can, it can show you a lot about social networks and power hierarchies, but it can be quite difficult to get people in the room. In terms of what you get out of it, you get a lot of information, a lot of, um, of voices on tapes or on video, which can be very, very difficult to, to transcribe or code or analyse because you are trying to deal with a number of disparate voices talking at the same time and can you find a, a continuity to what people are saying within that and one of the the more logistical things to think about with focus groups is that the the location can actually uh, influence who and how people engage because some people will need to travel so is it accessible by public transport or only by private car uh, is it at a time of day when only a certain strata of society will go so Will it be older people rather than younger people? Um, will it be in a church hall or a village hall or a council premises? And therefore, you might exclude people because of they don't want to, they don't feel comfortable going to certain locations. So the, the logistics of of setting up a um, a focus group can be quite difficult, as can the um, the data that you get out and how you try and analyse that. But if they're done well, if they're moderated effectively. If, if the participants are managed and they understand what the conversation is about and why you might be doing things a certain way, then you can get a lot of really interesting contextual data there, which you wouldn't necessarily get from a, a single interview, simply because you've got more people sparking off each other that actually gives you um, a far greater insight into how these ideas have been discussed locally. Okay, that's the end of, of, of this one. So we've done focus groups and questionnaires and we'll see you on the next one.